Have a seat on your porcelain throne. It's time to talk some shit on the Powell Movement. Welcome to the Powell Movement. I'm your host, Mike Powell, and this week I have nothing to talk about during my intro. It's amazing. My wife, Anne, is in a holding pattern until early fall for her big surgery, and she's cancer-free, and the Powells are getting ready to enjoy summer. Anne and I are going to stay around Seattle for the most part. I'll make a couple of trips down to Hood, and what I'm really excited for is my trip to Boulder in July to meet up with one of my best friends from high school to go see the final tour of Dead & Company. I'll go see two shows and spend one night in the parking lot, and my brain is scared, but it's also excited. But my summer doesn't even come close to comparing to what my kid's up to. His summer starts out with two weeks in Sweden and Rome. He'll go to Lollapalooza, eat breakfast at the Sistine Chapel, and he's got an amazing trip planned with one of his friends and their family. Then it's back to Seattle for two weeks, and then a week of Sikh skate camp, and then a week at Rehoboth Beach. And then summer's over because football starts. I'm so jealous. While I grew up privileged, my summers were all about two months of Jewish sleepaway camp every year. So instead of Friday night services and color war, he gets Travis Scott and the Coliseum. Why am I sharing this information? I have no clue. What I should be doing is telling you about my guest this week. He's an absolute legend. And when I say that, I really mean it. Think two-time Olympic gold medalist, five-time world champion ski racer with 336 World Cup starts and 25 wins. I'm talking about Ted Ligety, and his story's an amazing one that isn't as cut and dry as one would think. I'm not going to spoil any of the story, though, so there's no more talking about Ted in this intro. What I will do is talk about my amazing sponsors who make this show happen. I really want you to support them, to listen to their ads, and to buy their products. Without them, you wouldn't have over 300 episodes of ski and snowboard history to listen to. So please support the brands that support me. I'm talking about Stanley, Elon Skis, Rollerblade, Best Day Brewing, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, and High Cascade Snowboard Camp. Now, it's time to talk with Ted Ligety. I know we're in a hurry time-wise, so I'll just jump right into it. And your life has been defined by being a champion ski racer. And over the past couple of years, you've been more of a spectator. That isn't always the best experience. I mean, every week it seems like I was hearing people complain about how hard it was to watch races on the internet and how poor the coverage was when you're watching it. Did you experience that watching from home? This year was definitely difficult. I mean, TV rights with Fist and World Cup is a whole mess that needs to be organized in order for the sport to be healthy. And yes, I would say I was a consumer of the best runs on YouTube for the most part this year. And previous year, I was working with NBC, so I was a little bit more on the inside, but that was with the rights issues and everything a little bit more arduous than uh, I was looking to get involved in. <laughs> so is it frustrating for you to watch races as well? I mean, you've got friends out there that you want to watch. And when you try to get in on the internet and it's not working out for you, does it frustrate you? Oh, man, I really wish that ski racing was much easier to consume. I mean, this is a historical year with what Mikhail has been doing, but also then watching up with some of my buddies that are still racing World Cup. Yeah, it'd be nice to have a little bit more seamless access to that. But like I said, it's a whole ongoing rights issue within FIS that, you know, people like the Swiss and Austrians don't want to let up their little fiefdom in order to make the whole system work better. Well, corruption seems to run rampant in a lot of sports like this, unfortunately. <laughs> and unfortunately, that means it makes it hard to watch TV. But one of the things I've noticed over the years is you've formulated some strong opinions on the sport. And the one I found most interesting was the presentation of ski racing. Like the events themselves, they suck for the fans. And if you could tear down the whole formatting of the sport and rebuild it, how would Ted Ligety do it? Oh, man. I mean, my teardowns wouldn't necessarily be that popular with the people involved today, but I think they'd be good for the sport. I think the first piece of it is I would actually make the fields a lot smaller when you have a World Cup finals where there's 25 racers. I think the product is a lot better. I don't really know anybody who watches past Bib 30 unless they're waiting for watching some friend or somebody they know come down. So if it were up to me, I would limit the field size to 45, which at least is like reasonable for letting like the next group of athletes make their way into the into the seed but the only way you get guaranteed a spot for the next race if you're ranked inside the top 30 that's like one piece i think would tighten up the whole product another thing would be 
I mean, at least in giant slalom and slalom having the second run course set already set in the morning or in giant slalom, just do a redress. And so you only have a half an hour between when the last racer goes down first run and the start of the second run. Right now it's silly. I mean, if you watch a, a world cup GS or slalom race, you watch your favorite racers go in the top 15, maybe watch a little bit later, longer, and then it's three hours until you see, you see them again, which is pretty wild. You can't think of going to a basketball game and spending three hours waiting around at halftime. So it's pretty tough in that regard. That's got to be tough for the racers as well, like yourself, just sitting there for three and a half hours waiting to go again. It's a structure in which you're used to. Like You grew up doing that, so it's yeah, I guess completely normal for us. I think if we change the structure as a half an hour, it'd feel a rush. Like when we do the parallel events or when I've done the world pro ski tour, like you feel rushed when you have to jump back up there and do it, but that would all normalize out. It would start to feel more like a training pace, even though you're taking a run every 10 minutes more in training. But yes, I think overall, like it ended up being nice. Like you are one of the world cup guys or girls that are on the podium on a regular basis. I mean, you start your day at seven o'clock and you're not done with, media and all that other stuff until four o'clock in the afternoon. So, I mean, your day is stretched out crazy long. And so first from the athlete management perspective, I mean, you hear racers writing about the travel load and all that. I mean, if you can make a race day three hours shorter, <laughs> just based on a couple, you know, tweaks in the format and light structural changes that would make the system or the season a lot more sustainable for more of those athletes that are doing well, but also doing multiple disciplines and be better on the injury side of things as well. So definitely some things that, you know, would vastly improve, but the structures that be right now would really resist those types of changes. From what I was reading, it sounds like you almost wanted things to be bracket style, like your NCAA tournament style, not 64 teams, obviously, but maybe like 32 or a little bit higher and making it exciting, almost head to head competition like that. Is that something that you want, or is that me reading into what you wanted and reading it wrong? I mean, I think there is a time and place for the head-to-head -head format. The problem with that is it's extremely difficult to make a head-to-head -head format fair course-to-course. -course. You know, we're in an outdoor sport. One side of the trail is different than the other side, so one side gets rutted or the trails bend. or It's really hard to accomplish a fair dual race. So I would never suggest going deeply into that regard, but I think... Going back to like this, I guess the structural issue of it is, I mean, I honestly think there should be a World Cup A and a World Cup B where, you know, World Cup A, you have 40 racers in it and World Cup B is an alternating weekends and the top five of that race get to go into World Cup A the next weekend and the top five that were not in the top 30 from the weekend before get to go into the next weekend. And that way you really have to like fight to stay in if you're on that bubble, which I think is also interesting for the fan is they don't generally care about the person who's 30th in the world unless they have some sort of personal connection to them but all of a sudden if there's all these bubble guys that are about to get kicked off the world cup every single weekend based on their results it becomes a much more compelling race i think what formula one part of what's so compelling about that is that you might not have a seat the next year and right now ski racing doesn't have that i mean we have 75 racers in the race there's not so much worry about like whether you're going to stay in it or not. When you go to 40, obviously there's less of that, but that becomes a real compelling storyline. And then going to the TV rights piece of it, something like Thrive to Survive could never happen in ski racing because if you're trying to do any set of content around ski racing and try to get content for three races, World Cup races, you might have to talk to six different rights holders depending on how long you want that footage to last. So right now it's just an impossible task for any producer to come up with any course or content that like showcases the sport beyond just what happens inside the fence. So it kind of sounds like you feel like the whole dog and pony show is almost boring unless you're a racer or you're involved in the whole thing. And to me, it would seem like that if things continue to go the way they are, if they're not exciting and they're not drawing people in, especially here in the States, then the sport's going to see maybe a downfall in numbers just because kids have so many different choices these days. And ski racing and the regiment and the commitment that comes with it doesn't seem to be that exciting to kids. I mean, do you think we're going to see numbers dwindle in the coming years here in the States? I would not say I think it's a boring or, or bad product. I'd say when you watch a second run of a World Cup, it's exciting. Like watching the reverse 30 is an exciting proposition. 
but to consume the whole race first and second run is just nobody's going to structure their day around watching that kind of thing. So the second run of a World Cup is exciting, but not being able to watch the whole race, see how it all unfolds is really something that's missing. And I think there's definitely a lot of ways to highlight the sport because it is such an amazingly beautiful sport. It's so cool to see how fast people are going, the technique. All those pieces of it are amazing and awesome. It's just the structure of how it's all organized makes it really hard for the average fan to follow along. And I think there's some structural pieces that could be greatly improved for that. And yes, I mean, it's skiing. I mean, skiing is not going to be like anything ever on the terms of a big sport like football or basketball or anything just by the simple geography and the demographics of it and all, all those various pieces. But anybody who's a skier, which there's 10 million of them plus in the United States, most of those people should be ski racing fans. You know, ski racing is the pinnacle of the sport. It's the highest level of what the average person does on a daily basis that those people should be at least ancillarily tuned into the sport. And if we were able to give them a product that they could actually consume, I think we'd actually help grow the sport. Yeah. I mean, I feel like when I was a kid, the big common denominator that got everybody thinking about racing in the U.S. was NASCAR. It seemed like it was everywhere. And while it wasn't like full on racing, racing, it gave kids who had no idea what ski racing was a chance to go around some gates and maybe get a pin at the bottom. And that got you more interested. I'm sure it fed some people into real ski racing. Do you still see that as something as a feeder system here in the U.S.? Or I'm just thinking about how, other than, you know, in mountain towns, how you recruit more kids to go ski racing, just because, like I said, there's so many choices between the different disciplines of skiing these days. And for me, I mean, just looking through my kid's eyes, I don't see him ever gravitating towards the race course. And I know that there are some kids that, you know, their parents are going to push them that way. But to be like you and grow up in a mountain town and decide that you want to be a racer without any push from your family, because that's kind of how it happened with you. I mean, do you see that happening with a lot of kids today or are we going to start losing that? Yeah, I think NASTAR is an amazing feeder system. It's this, you know, amazing way for anybody anywhere to get introduced to ski racing, which I think this year it's really cool what Icon did is they made NASTAR free for everybody. So that's a huge piece. I mean, if you think of a park that costs them millions upon millions of dollars for a skier to put together a park, building on the jumps and a half pipe and all that stuff. And all you really have to do on a NASTAR course is staff it. And previously, you're charging $5, 10 a run down it. And that obviously is going to weed a lot of people out. But this year, when they made that free, I mean, now there's a line. People were really jonesing to go do the course. So I think the average skier wants to test themselves in the course. I think everybody likes the idea of going fast. People like competition. And I think... NASTAR and ski racing give people this cool outlet. It's not to like diminish or take anything away from the free ride side of things going to the park, but how many people are going up getting air out of the super pipe at Park City? Probably five people a day. Right. Um, where you know a lot of people can actually go through a, a NASTAR course and you go up against your buddy or you know, my five year old son goes up against my dad who's seventy five and Yes, my dad, the 75, can still beat him, but it's like, it's a race. And they, like, get a kick out of that. And that's something that is such a unique piece of ski racing is there is an accessible lower side of it. And I guess my argument on ski racing, you know, the step beyond that was people who like competition and going fast, that's really the only way to compete in the sport of skiing without being judged. I know as myself being a competitive person and knowing a lot of competitors in the free ride scene, like that is a point of contention a lot of times. So for me personally, I love ski racing. I think it's super fun. Yes. It's not the most frictionless thing to get into, but it's the most straightforward to know where you stand. You say not the most frictionless thing to get into, but thinking about your story, you come from a family that's not ski racers or not even real, like big time skiers. I don't even know how they got to Park City, but you grow up in Park City with this family that's not a big ski family, and you find ski racing on your own, given they give you skiing as like the mountain babysitter. It's like, ah, we're not going to do the trampoline park. We'll put the boys on the mountain all weekend, and they can have fun skiing there. But do you find ski racing or see ski racers and say, hey, I want to do that? I mean, in Park City, that's what you do. 
when you're a kid, did you go skiing? I mean, I don't think it's necessarily as ubiquitous now as it was when I was a kid. And then the next step beyond that is getting into the gates. All my buddies, you know, when I was nine years old, were all trying out for the Park City ski team. So it was my whole like friend group, even before we started ski racing, was the group of kids were all going to go into ski racing. So I kind of went that way. And that was, especially then, I mean, this is the early 90s in Park City. What other sports options at a high level if you're a competitive athletic kid? you have other than ski racing for the wintertime. I mean, in the summertime, we played soccer and mountain bikes, but in the wintertime, your thing was ski racing. So, I mean, that's a large part of why, especially the Park City ski team was so strong for so many years, was all the most athletic kids in the city went into that. So I was driven to it and gravitated towards it by my friend group. And then as I started getting a taste of it, I fell in love with it and was addicted to it. And for you, you try out for the Park City developmental team at like nine or 10 and you don't get a spot. And I can think when all your friends are on that program, it's got to be pretty crushing for a kid to hear that you're not good enough, but you come back and make it the next year. Is it one of those early learning moments in life that shapes you? And do you remember that feeling of not making it? Yes. I mean, tried out for the team, Park City ski team when I was nine, which was on like the young side of things. And I was not an early developer and I was not necessarily the standout. So... Yes, I was disappointed that a group of my friends made it that year and I didn't, but then also a group of my friends didn't make it that year and we went on to do it the next year. So it wasn't like, oh, I didn't get to ski that year. It was just I wasn't part of the Park City ski team. I was part of the Park City farm team, which is like a step below and step less serious. So it wasn't like I was down and out. There was an alternative, but yeah, I would have obviously loved to be on the Park City ski team the first year. But I mean, I think I was never until I was probably 17 or 18, one of the best kids even on my local ski club. So I guess that followed the trend there. (laughs) Were there any other sports for you growing up in Park City, or is it all about skiing? Yeah, I raced mountain bikes a little bit. I didn't take that, I guess, super serious. I did that until I was probably 12 years old and then played soccer up until I went to the winter sports school, so freshman high school. Okay. When you finally make the team, I would think there's no expectations for the first few years of your ski racing by any means. Do you pretty much spend those years having fun, being competitive, but also getting your ass kicked by stronger skiers? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I I love the sport, but I, yes, I was getting my ass kicked in races on a regular basis. On the Park City Ski Team, I was maybe the fourth or fifth best kid born in 1984, but I was driven. I loved it. I was having fun doing it. So that, like, kept me in it. And in some ways, actually, I credit, like, not being one of the best for my latest success. I mean, that gave me the opportunity to kind of play on my skis and be like outside the top sites for the coaches, you know, like after training, I would go, when we first started getting carving skis, this is around when I was 13 years old, like a few of my friends and I, we'd just go out and play on our skis, go like have little carving competitions so you could lay it over the furthest. I mean, we'd grown up on straight skis. So the second we got carving skis, it was a big eye opener. And we started playing on our skis without the coaches, just learning how to lay it over. And that was something that fit my style of skiing really well. And if I had been the best, like, would I have gone out there and and played in that regard and had that freedom and ability to just kind of like mess around and see what worked for me? I probably wouldn't have had those opportunities if I was better. So I credit like not being one of the best guys is giving me really the opening to explore my skiing and finding ways to get faster. And that was, you know, what led to, you know, later successes. And I heard back then the angles that you were getting in on those shape skis, they would call you, or I don't know if they'd call it to your face or just mention it, but like Archosaurus Rex. And I don't know if that <laughs> means anything to you, but it was that kind of your, your skiing was trying to get those skis as far over as you possibly could. Yeah. I mean, I remember like when I first got those carving skis, I mean, we were going out and skiing after training and first we were trying to drag our knuckles in the snow. And then, you know, a couple of days later it was trying to eat your elbow on the snow and then it was like basically trying to drag your armpit and I was able to figure out and manipulate my body in in order to to hold an edge doing those things and so a lot of my coaches on the ski team but even earlier were like oh Ted does cartoon turns like you see you know some like goofy cartoon that does something that's like not seemingly possible but they're able to pull it off somehow so yeah (laughs) cartoon turns is what a lot of my coaches would call them It's time for my first sponsor break. 
and I'm excited to add High Cascade Snowboard Camp to the mix. If you really consider yourself a great parent, you'll give the gift of summer snowboarding to your kid. This is your excuse to get the kids out of your hair and onto the Timberline Glacier at Mount Hood. Instead of having to plan the day for your kids, they'll have a plan of hot lapping top to bottom chairlift rides on real snow, they'll be getting expert coaching and making memories that are going to last a lifetime. If you want your kid to love you, you'll send him or her to Arbor Snowboard Signature Session. The dates are July 23rd to July 29th, and your kid will learn to shred from pros like Eric Leon, Mary Rand, Hayden Tyler, Steffi Luxton, Mike Lydell, and Estelle Pensaro. It really is a life-changing experience that your kid will thank you for forever. And if you don't want to hook your kid up or you don't have a kid, don't forget about the adult camp. It's the perfect mix of expert coaching and adult activities. So treat yourself. And come be a kid again this summer at High Cascade Snowboard Camp. You can find all about the kids and adult camps over at highcascade.com. Next up, it's Best Day Brewing. If you haven't tried what critics and myself are calling the best N.A. beer on the planet, you are missing out. Look, I'm not going to quit drinking beer completely. And I'm not asking you to do that. But we all have times where we want an ice cold beer, but we don't want something that's going to slow us down. You know, when you have to take your kid places, driving to the mountain, there's all kinds of reasons why you don't need to be slowed down in this life. And Best Day is crafted for us doers out there. The skiers, the snowboarders, the bikers, the skaters, the hikers. You know, people like us. And they support cool things like this podcast, Michelle Parker, Darren Ralphs, and they are all over the pickleball scene. So if you play that, know that Best Day is supporting you. And while all that stuff is cool, I drink Best Day for the flavor. I've been loving their hazy IPA and their Kolsch lately. It tastes just as good as its alcoholic cousins without all the calories. I mean, these are both under 70 calories. One's like 53. So next time you're at the store, pick up the N.A. beer that supports our kind of people and will make you have your best day ever. I'm talking about Best Day Brewing. To find out more about the brand, the events, and the flavors, head on over to bestdaybrewing.com. My final sponsor this round is Elan Skis. And if you haven't had a chance to ski on one of the Ripsticks models, you're not skiing as well as you possibly can. I mean, there's a reason why Elan's been building a cult following over the past couple years in the States. And it's because their skis are lively, playful, fun, all while remaining stable at speed. Ask anyone you see you skiing on an Elan, and they'll tell you right away, the skis are making them a better skier. And that's important. When you're buying a high-performance product, the hope is that it's going to make you perform better. And Elan does that every time. And Elan has some new models in the pipeline that are going to show a whole new generation how fun skiing can be when you're on an Elan. On top of that, they have a state-of-the-art factory that's powered by renewable energy provided by solar panels, and 70% of the materials they use to build their skis are sourced within 250 miles of their factory or less. To find out more about Elan, head on over to elanskis.com. Those are my sponsors. Now let's jump back into the podcast. When you're growing up, You're seeing the best in the world right in front of your eyes because growing up, Park City had a World Cup back then. What were those weekends like for race kids? Yes, we had the World Cup was here in Park City every year around Thanksgiving weekend, which honestly, I credit a huge amount. I mean, if I think of like all the lucky things in my life that transpired in order to like allow me to do what I was able to do, without the World Cup in Park City, there's no chance I would have been where I am today. I mean, we were able to watch the best in the world Thanksgiving weekend, so that's the beginning of the ski year, see the best in the world, you know, be inspired by them. But then on Monday after they left, we were training on it. We were training on a World Cup surface from end of November on, and that was a huge advantage. I mean, nowadays, the Park City ski team doesn't get on that hill until January, so they're missing a whole month in some of that block, and then it's not injected. So we had, you know, this icy, high-level World Cup surface with having had the inspiration of seeing the best in the world the week before, and that was a hugely transformative piece to be able to have that inspiration, but then also have that venue the next day totally change the trajectory of myself and, you know, a bunch of my fellow racers in the Park City Ski Team, because that was years we were putting one or two people on the U.S. Ski Team every year. When you get on those injected courses for the first time, is it like a holy shit moment? Like, whoa, <laughs> this is the difference between what I'm doing and what they're doing, and this is the totally different ballgame? Honestly, it's frustrating as as a younger kid. It was definitely harder. I would say in some respects, like it definitely made me the skier I was. It made me progress in like a regional sense, probably slower because I learned how to be a really good skier quickly, but being on bumpy, nasty ice doesn't necessarily teach you how to go fast from a young age. Yeah. So 
it allowed me to build this immense and great skill set from a young age. But that did not translate into speed until I made the US ski team, I made the US development team, and then started training some like easier stuff. I was like, oh, that's how I pair it with going fast. So it it wasn't always the easiest surface to feel good or learn how to actually generate speed, but it forced you to ski in the right way in order just to bank it to the bottom. I mean, I remember one day, like it was really icy, but then it snowed a little bit before, a couple of days before. So it was like moguls and ice. And most of the guys on the team weren't finishing the course. And, and I was, you know, gritting it out, making it to the bottom. And one of my coaches, who was like my favorite coach at the time, is like, man, Ted, if you keep going like that, keep working hard, you're going to be a great college ski racer. <laughs> that's like the last thing you want to hear, right? <laughs> yeah, that was like, great, fuck you. That's not what I want to be doing. <laughs> right. I, of course, was like the nice kid and smiled and said, yeah, thanks. But I was like, no, that's not what I'm really looking to be. I'm looking to try to race World Cup, of course. But that's just indicative of kind of how tough those conditions were. That just speaks a lot to your confidence too. When you're like, fuck you, that pisses me off almost to hear that I'm going to be a great college skier because I see myself on the world cup and with ski racing, confidence is a big deal. And it sounds like you were so confident in yourself, even when you weren't the fastest that you were telling your coaches and anybody that would listen that you were going to be an Olympic ski racer. And how did the coaches respond to that kind of confidence from a kid that maybe didn't have the speed to be an Olympic ski racer at that point? I wouldn't say that was ever like an externalized goal. My coach then didn't know necessarily I had aspirations for that. And honestly, like one of my coaches when I was 17, the year before I made the ski team, on like my goal sheet was like NCAA champion. He's like, why do you write this? And I was like, because I thought it's like a really realistic goal. And he's like, write down what you actually really want to do. So that was, I mean, something later. And so obviously that then I was like, win World Cups. But yes, you know. When you're a kid, I mean, I also wanted to be John Stockton after watching the Jazz go to the finals a handful of times. So you have all sorts of aspirations that you don't ne necessarily externalize. <laughs> sure. And then are you aware of like the whole new school movement of skiing as well? Like, do you ever get into the train park with your spandex on after race practice? Yeah, for sure. In my freshman year at the Winter Sports School, a kid named Tanner Hall was in our class. He was a mogul skier that year and then came back the next year as X Games champion. So, yes. I was always taking a lot of inspiration from the free ride and snowboard side of things. I mean, I was always a big fan of, you know, watching all those few movies, MSP or TGR, or even some snowboard movies, that side of things. So I took a lot of inspiration from that. I mean, we free skied a ton. I mean, that was a big part of my development. I think one of the reasons why I gravitated towards Giant Psalm was that I spent so much time free skiing. And if you're out there free skiing for fun, whether it's in a big bowl or through the moguls or on the groomer like you're kind of doing more gs tempo returns so that's kind of like where my style of skiing derived from but i was hugely influenced by that I would, yeah i would go out and like hit some 360s on the, on the big jumps i was never like the best or most air aware kid out there i could go big and had balls but i wasn't all that stylish or didn't have a, a good repertoire for tricks <laughs> but even early on like by the time you get to the winter school i mean you are always the small kid, I feel like. Like, you don't hit your growth spurt until, like, your junior or senior year. So I would think that it would be even hard for you to get to get the speed for the bigger of the jumps. But when you're the smaller kid at a school like the winter school that's full of elite athletes, do you get picked on at all being the little guy? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, yeah, I, did, I was, like, yeah, lanky kid, for sure. I mean, I, there's definitely a hierarchy in a school like that, especially then based on how good you were. And I definitely took my lumps and honestly I mean nobody likes to get bullied or picked on but some of that was actually I think nobody should ever say it's beneficial but it definitely hardened me in the sense that made me a, a stronger more grittier competitor later although I would not wish that on anybody else everybody takes these things differently so being bullied maybe it didn't help you become an Olympic champion but it definitely helped drive you a little bit yeah, that was a motivator and it made me grittier and had like mental toughness. I was able to like shrug stuff off maybe better because of that experience than I would have maybe otherwise. And yeah, I mean, it lit a fire under my ass, that's for sure. So yes, I credit it with some of my mental toughness. But like I said, it wasn't necessarily the most enjoyable experience. <laughs> no, for sure. I can, I can imagine. And it sucks you had to go through that. But it's cool you were able to find some positive out of that because most people don't find positive stuff out of being bullied. But you did. 
when you're at the winter school, it's one of these elite ski academies, given you've got all different kinds of skiers at the school. But how is the winter school different than those elite academies on the East Coast? So the main difference is the reverse school year. So we were going to school April and November. So we had all winter off of school. We'd have to do a couple of book reports, which were frankly pretty easy to get done a week before school started in April. So that was the, really the main difference. And then also like you got to be able to go ski at your home club. So Park City Ski Team was the best club far and away at that time. So I didn't have to leave home to follow my ski racing dreams as I just stayed home and, you know, had the best training in the world from November 25th on. And that was huge. I mean, so I, I had some friends that went to Burke and GMBS and all that. But I honestly think like the Park City Ski Team and, and the Winter Sports School were by far the best places, especially for me and especially at that time. And my last question about the Winter School, it might not be my last question, but I forgot to ask you about it when we were talking about Tanner, was if you were there his freshman year and then he came back after the X Games, were you there when he got kicked out of school? Uh, yes, I, I was. Yeah, we were classmates. I mean, our freshman class was eight of us. <laughs> so, yes, we were in, in class together until, yeah, um, I guess it was junior year, yeah, that he left. <laughs> he got kicked out for smoking weed, I think. They found out he smoked a joint. Was that, like, big gossip and big, like, holy shit news at the school? Honestly, like, he was nobody that freshman year. And I don't think he had any troubles in that regard. I mean, obviously, like, in that school, they did, like, random drug testing and they tried to keep it as clean as possible. But I mean, weed is weed, like people do it. And I guess he was a little bit less bashful about his use of it than yeah. most people would be. So at some point, yes, they didn't like that he was kind of rubbing in their face. And there was some confrontation around that. But yeah, he was like, yeah, one of my good friends in, in school. And yeah, smart kid too. I mean, he was definitely like a, a fun classmate and that was cool. But yeah, unfortunately, that didn't last the whole bit of it. <laughs> I think it's probably fortunately for him because he was able to get out of school and blow up his whole career pretty much right about then. But as far as your racing goes, in 2001, your results start getting better. You get a ninth in the Vale Slalom, then you're top 20 in Copper, and you're finally moving up the ranks your junior year in high school. Is that when you start filling out size-wise? Is that when you start getting into the body of Ted? So yeah, after my junior and, and senior year, I start feeling out a little stronger and, and starting to figure out how to go fast. Like those pieces come together. I mean, I was definitely a late bloomer fist wise. I only skied one fist race my first year fist and only a handful of others and really didn't have any impactful races until the spring of my second year fist. And it was just a slow process of just figuring out how to go a little bit faster. The technique piece of it, you know, this is coinciding with the shape ski progression as well and figuring out my own style of skiing within that and tweaking with my equipment all these things that I was learning about kind of started to come together when I was about to graduate high school. But you're still behind the curve at this point because you're just figuring out how to become fast and I'm going to talk about going into your senior year really and you've got other friends that are being named to the U.S. ski team. Is that frustrating seeing other people? I'm sure it's exciting too, but frustrating seeing other people get named to the team and you're kind of getting passed over? Is it almost feeling like your window's kind of shrinking and shrinking? Yeah, I mean, I had a lot of friends who were making the U.S. ski team at the time or also competitors that I believed internally that I was better than making it. And, you know, that was, I guess, part of that whole chip in my shoulder is like that was a motivator, like seeing kids that when I would watch their skiing, I'm like, I'm better than that. Which I think like that was a, some of my internal like self-confidence was, yes, this kid that made the ski team would kick my ass in a race. But I'd watch the ski and I'd be like, oh, I mean, he's not actually better than me. He's just faster right now. And so I think I was able to like not get down on myself for the process of it because I was really into like watching the technical skiing. I was really into analyzing the sport. And if I looked at my own skiing versus, you know, some of the people that were better than me. I was like, oh, I'm like right there. I just need like to figure out the pieces to go fast. So it was frustrating watching that, but it was also motivating to see like, oh, these people are making it and I actually feel like I ski better than them. I could see that. And so with senior year, I'm sure your parents are focused on you having a successful life. And right now you're not really on track to make the U.S. ski team. I'm sure they want you to go to college and 
senior year would be the year that you have to crush it or else you're kind of screwed and almost have to go to college. Do you do anything different leading up to that year to just get you stronger? Because you're famous for your work ethic. It sounds like from people I've talked to, there's no one that pushes more weight than you do. There's no one that'll go to Portillo and do two minute downhill and GS runs all day long, just destroying their legs. Then they'll go work out. Then they'll go play basketball. And that's just how you are. And I'm sure you've always been that way. But do you feel that senior year is like the year you have to make shit happen? Yeah, I mean, I applied to schools. I did the whole like process as if I was going to go to school. And so, yes, I was motivated definitely to make the team that year because I knew if I didn't, then I'd be going off to school in which not that college is like you're leaving your dream. I mean, there's a lot of people that have made the U.S. ski team out of college, but definitely is not like the most straightforward way to become, you know, World Cup ski racer. So definitely like some crunch time motivation, but also like I was overlooked by a lot of big ski schools at that time as well for not being good enough. So I think that was also a motivating factor. So yeah, I mean, I had a great year. I made like the U.S. ski team, or I made the U.S. development team by the skin of my teeth. It was still like a 10,000, like you had to pay $10,000 to be on the U.S. ski team that year on the development team. My dad's like, okay, you have one year of this and then you're going to school. And I was like, okay. And then was instantly racing World Cup from then on. So my parents definitely were a little apprehensive about me jumping in both feet first into this and, and not going the school route. Well, before we even talk about your parents having to pay 10 grand for you to be on the USD team, that senior year season, that's when everything comes together. Like you said, you're at podiums at a bunch of US events. You start traveling the world and podium there too. You take second at the world juniors for slalom. And when you think back of like that senior year, what's the most important race or races of that season for you that really just let you knew you were about to turn a corner? I mean, there's some Norams in there where I was like mixing it in there with some of the best guys. I mean, we were in Noram when I was maybe sixth and the guy that won ended up being 11th in two races the next World Cup. So knowing like that you're in there with that level of speed was encouraging. I had like one fist race at the kind of the beginning of the year where it was a bunch of the best college athletes and I was starting, you know, in the late 30s, 40s and won both of those days, which was, you know, big jump up forward, point profile wise. So it was, you know, a bunch of like races amongst those. And when I, I went to World Juniors that year and didn't do particularly well, but just by the fact I made World Juniors and was good enough in the Norm standings, made the development team that year. And then, you know, having the opportunity to train at the U.S. ski team that summer was where I was able to make that real big jump. One thing that we passed over in this whole area is the 2002 Winter Olympics that are in Salt Lake City. Yeah. You get to forerun that course at the Olympics. Your coaches say you were named to forerun the course because you outwork everyone, and they want to send a message to the rest of the team, be like Ted. But was it also that you didn't make the Junior World team at that point, and you were in town for the Salt Lake Olympics? or Because I couldn't really figure that out, although I was looking. There's definitely a happy coincidence there. Like There were other more important races that the U.S. ski team athletes were racing. It was World Juniors, and I think there were some Norams back east. So there's a handful of races that were coinciding with Olympics that I did not make. So the competitive pool to be able to forerun was much smaller. And then, yes, I wasn't necessarily the best on the Park Zee ski team results-wise at that time to necessarily deserve that start or that opportunity. But, yes, I was known for being a hard worker and showing that grit. So I think that was a little bit of a sending a message and rewarding kind of that grit and hard work. And I'll say like we had the World Cup in Park City every year and like seeing the best in the world from outside the fence was hugely inspirational. But then to be in like the athlete tent on these athletes' biggest day of their career was a huge eye opener. To realize like you're sitting across this the table from Bodie Miller and seeing JP Vidal like two tables away and all these racers that are like, were your heroes and hear them talking like my 17 year old friends and I talk at a ski race was like, so eye opening. I was like, whoa, these guys are not robots. They're just like me and my buddies. They just do it a lot better and a lot faster, but they're not some mechanical robot that is programmed to be cold and calculated on a day like this there's normal people and i was like oh i can be me and race there was a big eye opener and really important i think for me to see firsthand to see that like oh what i'm doing now isn't such a big leap from what i want to be doing it's an amazing opportunity you're with all of the racers it's got to just feel like you totally belong 
but you're also so far from actually belonging in the Olympics as well. Is it discouraging or is it like just setting the path of like, I'm going to be here? Yeah, I mean, I did not like ski at a high level there. I mean, when you're four on a ski race, you're basically just the guinea pig to make sure the course is set okay and it's safe. And I was not skiing at a high level there. So, you know, what happened once I left the start gate and once I got to the finish line, I would say was not the valuable part of that experience. The valuable part of that experience was pretending as if I was part of the race and seeing what actually happens with the best in the world on that stage and what they're actually doing when they're not actually going to the gates. That was the most important piece for me, just to realize that it was uh, actually an approachable goal from you know mental and, and psychological standpoint. When you forerun a race like that, do they give you the whole U.S. kit, give you a credential that gets you everywhere throughout the Olympics? And does it make you feel like you're an athlete, even though you're not? A little bit. I did not get the whole kit, unfortunately. I was still in a <laughs> semi, semi-tattered downhill suit. But yes, I had the credential for the two races that I was. So I didn't have this like all access pass. I had kind of an all access pass for the two forerunning events. But I mean, I was lucky, like having in your hometown before I was even given that opportunity. I mean, my family, we got tickets for the combined and the downhill, I think, up at Snow Basin, which was really cool to go watch. The heroic performance from and the combined of Bodie was was really amazing to watch in the stands. And so, you know, it's just cool to like have that in your backyard have that experience when people ask me what my favorite Olympics that I participated in is and I say Salt Lake <laughs> even though I wasn't technically an Olympian there just the whole scene at, at Salt Lake was just second to none how they put it on the organization of it venues and all those pieces were just really hard to compete with in any other place it's time for my second sponsor break and if you haven't shopped at Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, you aren't only letting me down, you are missing out on the best shopping experience online or in person. Peter Glenn has all the brands, all the deals, and the best products from the world of ski, snowboard, inline, wakeboarding, and so much more. What I love about Peter Glenn is that they price match. If you find a product at a reputable dealer for a lower price, Peter Glenn will match that price. They also offer free shipping on orders of $50 or more, and it's always easy to return something at Peter Glenn if you don't like it. That's important, because if you get something that doesn't fit, you don't want to hassle returning it. And some retailers make it a hassle, not Peter Glenn. So next time you're in the market for anything outdoor-related, support the brand that makes this show happen and head on over to peterglenn.com. Next up, it's Rollerblade. Ski season is coming to a close, and if you're like me, your ski legs are really firing right now. If you're also like me, you sometimes slack in the summertime, and getting those ski legs back is so hard. I found a way to fix that problem. Inline skating. Not only is it fun, but it'll keep you in ski shape all year long. All while burning the same amount of calories that you would by running or biking. And if you're a runner, switch to inline. It's going to save your knees. And if you're a biker, save your bank account. Skates are a fraction of the cost of a bike and they travel so much easier. And for everyone, Rollerblade has an award-winning skate to ski app that will get you in the best shape of your life for ski season. To find out more about the app and to find out more about all the amazing skates, head on over to rollerblade.com. My final sponsor is Stanley, the iconic Seattle brand that has been outfitting your adventures since 1913. For over 90 years, Stanley has been the right choice for the planet. And if you don't have a Stanley water bottle, it's time to rethink your drinking habits. I mean, it's 2023, and using single-use plastics are unacceptable these days. Good thing is, I'm going to make it easier than ever for you to get that water bottle, all of your camping and storage needs, and more. Yep, I'm going to save you 30% on all of your Stanley products. If I were you, I would pick up six of the pint glasses, which I use every single day, a water bottle, and a bunch of their food storage and camping stuff that you're going to need this summer. To get the deal, all you need to do is head on over to Stanley1913.com, go shopping, and when you check out, Enter the code DRINKFAST, that's all lowercase and no spaces, and you're going to save 30% on your order. It's a sweet deal that I hope you take advantage of. Those are my sponsors. Now it's time to jump back into the podcast. When you're graduating senior, at the end of that ski season, what's the conversation with your coaches? Are they telling you that you have a shot at the D team? Are they telling you that you should stick with it? Or do you get named the D team right then? How does that work itself out? Yes, yeah, so that year I was invited on a couple trips to the ski team. So I kind of like had an idea that I was going to be kind of on the bubble for getting in there. So one of the head development team coach at the time, Adam Chadborn, yeah, like called us up and we're like, hey, you're invited to be part of the U.S. development team this year. It's going to be 10 grand. Are you in or are you out? (laughs) (laughs) 
And for me, obviously, that's an easy yes. My parents had some more questions about it, but ultimately, they wanted me to follow my dream. So they were very supportive of it. It's kind of crazy how that's how the ultimatum is given to you. Because if you think about other sports, and I'm not going to say skiing's not a real sport, because it is. But when you get a call that says like, hey, we've got a spot 10 grand, you're in or you're out. It's just a weird thing. I don't think you'd find that in football or minor league baseball or any other sports. It's weird how skiing works. It's got its own peculiar things to it. Yeah, I mean, that's changed. Like, that's ebbed and flowed. I mean, there was years when you made the USB team and it was the 30 grand check you had to write. So luckily, that's gone away. You're not having to write checks to be on the Alpine team anymore. But yeah, I mean, at that point, honestly, $10,000 was definitely less than we were paying that year for my year. So I guess in some senses, it was a discount, but it speaks to kind of the, the unfortunate side of ski racing is how expensive it is. With the U.S. team, is it all because it's like a, a private entity that's not getting government funded and they need to have sponsors and that's why some years you have to pay more than others? Is that kind of how that works? Yeah, so like the U.S. ski team versus like the Austrian or Swiss or French or any, any of the early Euro teams is different in the sense that like the Austrian team is an arm of the Austrian tourism bureau and so they're getting government money that way i mean same thing with the swiss and a lot of those european countries have some sort of government funding to them so in the u.s it's strictly sponsor and donor based and so yes there's some ebbs and flows to that there's some structural planning pieces to that as well so that's changed and i think they've gotten better as far as you know figuring out the structure of how to spread out those costs but yeah, it's it's kind of funny. There's a, a major difference between the U.S. and Europe as far as how these things are funded. Yeah. And then when you are on the D team, what does this mean? Do you live at the center of excellence? Are you training and traveling with the A team and their coaches? Are you living out of a suitcase from November to April? What does it mean being on the D team? It means I'm still living at home with my parents. <laughs> and then just, yeah, traveling with a different group of, of athletes. I mean, being from Park City where I was lucky that I would just ride my bike to the gym and that's where I worked out. And that was like really simple, pretty frictionless. So the only difference like during the summertime for me was really, I was biking to a different gym and then just training with a higher caliber of athletes and having access to the sports science piece. I mean, that was also like part of why when I made the US ski team, I put on like 20 pounds that summer, just eating and training. And we did two separate one month stints of the OTC in Colorado Springs and being 18, 19 year old kids, we're all trying to like bulk up and and ski racing being bigger is for the most part better. And so we wake up, we go have as much of a breakfast. We like compete by basically how much we could fit in our stomachs and then, (laughs) (laughs) and see how many trays full of food and then go work out and then immediately go back. And we were probably eating six meals a day. And so I think like most of us put on like 10 pounds of weight at one of those months, just because we were, hammering the gym so hard and just like at the OTC it's just an open cafeteria 24 7 and it's free food and if you're an 18 19 year old kid and it's free pretty good food and you're all kind of competing to see how much weight you can gain we stuffed ourselves (laughs) pretty full every day we were meeting with the nutritionist they had us log and we were eating like 8,000 calories a day. (laughs) (laughs) That's incredible. And, you know, when you think of your personal goals, like if you told your D team self that you would one day make the U.S. team and make the Olympic team, would that be considered mission accomplished? Or was it always about World Cup wins and Olympic gold? The ultimate goal was always World Cup and Olympics. I mean, I think like my goal sheet that year was like win an ORAM title or something like that. And then like get a World Cup spot the next year and like try to be like a fringe athlete for the 2006 Olympics, which is, you know, two years later. So the World Cups were always on the horizon, but like that wasn't something I was really thinking that was going to come my way that season. But Park City had a great snow year that fall. So we were actually able to train on the race hill in Park City before the World Cup. And they did a time trial and they like reluctantly let us D-team athletes do the time trial. And I ended up winning the time trial. And that gave me a start. So my first start with the U.S. ski team was the World Cup at Park City. That first start is your first and the last Park City World Cup ever, right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I started 69th, I finished 59th, and they never raced there again, unfortunately. So, yes, it was really cool to be able to race, at least get one World Cup race in Utah. I mean, that's in, and in Park City to be on the home mountain, the home, 
race that I had grown up watching was really a cool experience. I'm super happy that I was able to do it, but obviously it was a, a meaningless result, but, uh, you know, nice to be able to get that opportunity at least once. Does it create other distractions when you're at home or is it just one big party? Yeah, I mean, I was still living at home at that point. So it's kind of funny because even though it was my first World Cup, it kind of felt like any other race. It didn't like have the same prestigious feeling to it because I was living at home with my parents. So I wasn't like staying with the team. I was like, if I'm in Park City, well, I might as well be staying at home. The coaches kind of thought the same thing, like keep it comfortable. So it didn't like have all this like build up to it. And, you know, at that point, I had a bunch of friends that are like still racing, racing college or taking PG years or whatnot. So they're all kind of shocked and amazed and excited that I was that I was actually racing the World Cup. So definitely had a lot of like nerves because I guess I wasn't supposed to necessarily be there. But also I still had, you know, a ton of friends and family that were there watching me, but unexpectedly. Gotcha. And then ski towns are famous for partying. And I would think when you have your first World Cup race at your hometown, it's got to be a big night of partying, even though you finished 59th. And <laughs> I think that, but I don't know you. And in the life of Ligeti, is there post-race beers? Well, I was 19. Uh, don't tell my parents I did have a fake ID at the time, but I was living at home. So that kind of put some friction on what, what you get involved in. And then also we had Norams on the same hill on that Monday, Tuesday. So in a sense, that was kind of the more important objective. So between those three things, I guess it wasn't the party that you would necessarily expect. And at the time, also, night being 19, you know, a lot of my like, closer friends were off at college, too. So it wasn't kind of like the same scene that maybe I would have had if it was elsewhere at a different time or, or whatnot. <laughs> well, I was just trying to set you up for one of your best party stories, because I talked to Ralph's yeah. and he had talked about bartending in Kitzbühel after a race that he won there. And what is the Ted Ligeti version of that, given maybe not when you're 19, you could be 26 or however. But when you think about your post-race biggest celebration where you just woke up feeling terrible, but it was just amazing all around, <laughs> what was that celebration for you? Oh, man, it's hard to, to pinpoint one. I mean, the downhillers really haven't made in that sense. You know, Darren, those guys have the better stories because for the first bunch of years, if you're at Kitzbühel and you're a slalom racer, you're racing on Sunday. So the town is going off on Saturday night and the town is dead on Sunday night. So your your real opportunities aren't as often as the downhill guys. So being a young kid on the World Cup, you're always a little frustrated by it. that disparity. But Schladming was always like our big, the night slalom there, there were 60,000 people. And then we go out in the town after those races. Honestly, actually, probably one of the bigger ones was in Schladming as well after I won the GS, the three medals that I won at World Championships there. We went out hard that night, of course. Champagne, beer party, you know, having Alberta Tomba come to the party and all that stuff was, was fun. And That's uh, crazy. So, yeah, the tech skiers really get the raw end of the deal as far as, you know, the World Cup party scene where Bingen and Kitzbühel, which are the kind of the crazier party weekends, you know, if you're, if you're racing the slalom, you got to be ready on Sunday. So when you're at this level of competition, I given in our timeline, we're only at 19, but I'm going to bounce all over with some of these questions. But when you're at the World Cup level of competitions, you're racing for money. Are things cutthroat, like super intense and people don't like each other here and there? Or is the vibe similar to what you'd see at a slope style or a big mountain comp where everybody, I mean, you kind of deferred to it earlier when you're talking about the Olympics and seeing how everybody was just like you guys. But is there a little more intensity there at the Olympic and World Cup level? I would say most of the field is pretty friendly. It gets long. I mean, some of my best friends nowadays are some of my closest competitors. That's because I can't really impose myself. If like Marcel Hersher is my rival, it's not like I'm guarding him on a basketball court and I can like get physical and tough with him. Like there's nothing I can do. He's racing a different time than I am. And then we sit in the same lodge in between runs and are spinning and having a meal like next to each other. Like, so it's a really like social and a lot of good camaraderie, I guess, within, within that scene. I mean, of course, like there's a handful of people that are dicks and not, not everybody likes them, but by and large, like I would say the world cup scene is very tight knit and, and jovial and everybody gets along really well. And I guess the dicks that are on the world cup would probably be dicks anywhere. People just wouldn't like them because they're not good people. And that's why people don't like them. <laughs> yeah, pretty much. On the other side of things, we don't have time to get through all the details about your race career. And we're going to talk about some, but we're going to skip over a lot of the D team stuff. And how long does it take before you get moved up from the D team to the full on US ski team? Basically, like right from the get go. So I like did the whole summer training time 
with the D team. And then since I raced that first World Cup, I ended up getting moved up to the Europa Cup slash World Cup team. So I ended up skiing a bunch of World Cups that year, scored World Cup points that year, which, you know, it's pretty rare when you have a 19 year old kid that's still a junior on their first year of the team scoring World Cup points. So I never skied with my like teammates ever again, really that year after that first race. So I was kind of like shipped off to a different segment of the team on the World Cup team with me being a 19 year old with a bunch of guys in their late 20s, early 30s. So that was definitely a different scene. <laughs> so I'm guessing you get bumped up to the world of like the Bodies, Stevens and Darren's and you're traveling with a whole different group of people. But who gets bumped off of that team or who gets demoted when you get put up there? Because it's not like there's an unlimited amount of spots. Like if you get moved up, I would think someone gets bumped out. Yeah, sometimes. I mean, if you score World Cup points, you should create another spot. So I can't like pick any one person I had bumped out. I think it was more like I bumped out one of the ancillary guys that was like kind of bouncing between like one of the more Europe Cup level guys. And there was, you know, maybe four or five of them that were getting opportunities here and there. And and I just showed the more promise and was getting better results. So it wasn't like I was bumping out some like more established World Cup guy. I was kind of bumping out somebody who's maybe two years, three years older than myself, who just wasn't having necessarily the success to really be granting those opportunities to. And is that just part of the game or does that affect friendships? That's part of the game. I mean, like I said, I was like 19. It wasn't like I was friends with the 24-year-old kid that I was taking their spot necessarily with. I mean, I think there's probably like a little bit of animosity there. But at the same time, it's not judged. Like, if I beat them in a course, what can they say? Like, what's their argument? There's no argument to be had if somebody's beating you. And that's just kind of the reality of it. If somebody's faster and they're showing the results and they take your spot, your only way to combat that is to get faster. So I guess it's cut and dry. Whereas, like, I would say, like, in that sense, in the 2006 Olympics, it was between myself and another guy, Dane Spencer, who was, like, an established guy on the World Cup for that last GS spot. And that's somebody who I did, like, bump off the team. And he was actually, like, one of my closest mentors my first couple years in the team. And I did bump him off the Olympic team, and he didn't make the Olympics that year. And then raced to NORAM the same day as I won the Olympic combined and he broke his neck and his pelvis and was almost died and so to think that like that was kind of a, a gut-wrenching experience to like win the olympics and then later that night while you're out drunk partying here that like one of your mentors and teammates and the guy you bumped off the team was like fighting for his life in the hospital was a pretty big whiplash and he came back and i mean we're still close but like yeah in some senses like when there's more finite spots like the Olympics, and especially that year when all four people that made the Olympic team ended up having podiums at the end of the year by that, in that sense, like that was a tough, really stacked team to make and to bump somebody off that was your hero and then have the consequence of that, that they had a life-changing accident was tough. Dude, heavy, heavy story. Talk about the thrill of victory and the agony of defeat right there. But Jesus, man, that is a, a crazy coincidence of events that happened there. I'm going to go to something different that should be a little bit more light. When you're a rookie on the U.S. ski team, is there any hazing or any of that type of shit that happens? A little bit. I mean, I guess the main thing that would happen, like, you'd get mattress monstered, which is you'd have one of the older guys in the team flip over your mattress while you're sleeping in it and, like, wedge it into a corner and <laughs> rip the sheets off, and you'd be, like, stuck underneath your mattress in the corner of the room was, like, kind of something that would happen every once in a while. How about the haircut tradition? So the haircut tradition actually... Myself and a couple other guys started, and it got shut down for hazing. I don't feel like it was, yes, I guess in the traditional form of hazing, yes, the rookie haircut is hazing, but if you got top 15, you got to cut my hair however you wanted to. So I was actually putting myself on the line, and it almost happened twice. Two guys almost got there. And then once that tradition continued on, it was actually the most recent rookie to have scored World Cup points was the one who got to do the haircut for the next rookie. So yes, I guess in the traditional sense is hazing. In the non-traditional sense, like most of the time when somebody's coming up for their first World Cup, like you have no idea who this person is. You're in your late 20s or 30s and you don't know who this 19 or 20 year old kid is. And it's like an opportunity for the whole team to like sit around and cut a ridiculous haircut. But it wasn't like the oldest guy on the team dictating everyone. And then if they ended up coming through and having an amazing day, which the stats were out there to like likely somebody was going to end up cutting my hair. 
I would have happily had some like a Friar Tuck or a Mohawk or something if some rookie came through and ended up getting top 15. Well, I like the fact that there was repercussions for the people that were putting the thing on as well, that you could get your hair cut. It does take a little bit away from the hazing, but it is a haircut against someone's will. Yeah. So whatever. The 05-06 season for you is a game changer. This is an Olympic year, and you start off that season with a third place at the World Cup slalom in Beaver Creek. And this is a place that you've seemingly dominated at during your career. Could you ever pinpoint the reason why you consistently did well at Beaver Creek? So later in my career is mostly because of in Giant Slalom, and that hill just really synced up well with my technique. My technique in Giant Slalom, I like was smoother and was able to like arc more and generate more speed out of the turn than, than most of my competitors. And so that like fit really well because the Beaver Creek Hill in Giant Slalom is like on the more moderate side. Like you have to be able to carry more speed. There's a couple like steep pitches, but compared to Alta Badia, it definitely doesn't have quite the same bite and vertical to it. So it matched up really well to my skiing. And then also on the Super G side of things, it matched up really well too, because it was a steeper and more technical Super G than really anything else out there. So I think largely because the hill matched up with me, but then also like World Cup skiing for Austrian is traveling less than I did when I was 14 years old, racing Intermountain. I mean, almost 90% of the World Cups are in Central Europe within a you know six mile driving radius from Switzerland. So therefore, nobody's ever really driving more than 10 hours to races. And Park City to Bachelor is, uh, is a longer drive than that, which I was doing on a regular basis growing up. So to take them out of getting out of their own car and, and not being able to sleep in their own bed on Sunday night and have to live out of a duffel bag was a game changer also in the sense that it was a little bit tougher of a mental battle for some of the Europeans to be on a more of a, an away terms. Um, so that also helps. And having friends and family there was obviously a big motivator as well. Awesome. So you make the Olympic team that year pretty early. You know you're going from November, I think from the Beaver Creek race, but I'm not really sure. And that's got to be totally mind-blowing to you, how far you've come in just like three or four years where you're like a junior in high school and there isn't really that big of a future for you in ski racing. Four years later, you're going to go to the Olympics. And do you ever think back then how fast everything was happening to you? Yeah, for sure. When you're like in the midst of it, like once you like reach one goal, you like obviously move on to the next one. You like your sights and your uh, expectations constantly evolve. So like when you're in it, it doesn't necessarily seem that fast. But there are times when you step back and you're just like, yeah, holy shit, I'm already getting on the podium. And yeah, you see, start to see these things. But the perspective, I guess, isn't there as much when you're in the, in the midst of it because being a competitive guy and like knowing when you have the speed and you have the speed in training and you're like beating likes to Bodhi in training, like you're like, oh shit, then like I have the ability to be on the podium. And when you do it, it's shocking and it's a dream come true. But you're like also, yeah, I, I've been showing the speed. If I didn't do that, then I would mean I was bad in the head and not good at the race course, which I think is like one of my like knocks on a lot of like the kids in the park seat or on the US ski team is they're always like, oh, I trust the process. But like, hey, dude, if you're beating me in training, like step it up. You should be in the top 10 in a World Cup. If you're beating me in training, don't be like psyched when you get 25th and that's your best race of the year. Like you got to step up. If you're fast, you got to show that you're fast on race day. And so I think that was a good skill of mine that I was able to like quickly realize that like, oh, if I'm fast here in this atmosphere, I should be able to translate this to being fast in a race and translate that to results, which I think is obviously like the hardest part of ski racing is like the mental aspect and trying to bridge training speed to race speed. There's, you know, a hundred guys out there that have beat me in training and I've gone on to win the race two days later and they never score a World Cup point in their life. And so that's part of the hardest piece of this sport is it's so mental. And you are in the right mental space when it's leading up to the Olympics because you do well in Beaver Creek, but then you keep your foot on the gas. You get another third in Slovenia. The first race of the year, you take second. You get a third at Westendorf. And these are all big podiums. And big podiums always make me think of money. And first, how much do you get for first, second, or third on the World Cup? It really depends on the race. I mean, generally, like, the prize money is, like, 30 to 50,000 euros. Kind of depends on, on the race. I mean, Kitzbühel is, like, 70, 80,000 euros. So there's a couple that are bigger, but... Generally, a win is in the in the thirty to, to forty range. 
And so, yeah, you're all of a sudden is like a 21 year old kid. Yeah, and 21, like that year when I was getting on the podium, still living at home with my parents. I mean, I wasn't making enough money before that to buy a place or, or really, I mean, I rented, I guess, a place that summer for two months and living with friends and training and stuff like that. But outside of that, I mean, you're not really making anything until you're reaching that higher end on the World Cup. Then you have sponsors that are also giving you incentive as well. So that money's stacking up and... One thing that I noticed is you famously skied with a homemade sponsor helmet that said, thanks, mom and dad. And was it embarrassing <laughs> yeah. that you couldn't sell your headspace back then? I mean, my first year on the World Cup, people like would sometimes like write for rent or like do funny stuff, like weird stuff like that for trying to like, bring attention to your headgear sponsor. So I, I thought, honestly, like the best way to bring attention to it was show my real sponsors at that point, which were the, my mom and dad. So it's not embarrassing because it's not like... Every single person has Red Bull on their head or whatnot. But obviously, yeah, like you want that headgear sponsor both like to feel validated and like you have you're worth something in that sense, but also from the standpoint that you're actually bringing in more income. So honoring my mom and dad in that sense was proper in the sense that that's who was like, my true sponsor at that point. And also like a funny way to kind of bring attention to it. And that led Park City Skier to be my headgear sponsor that Olympic year. And when you think about the headgear sponsor, I mean, that is the most precious piece of real estate, I feel like, for a ski racer is that front head spot. What's that worth during an Olympic year? Honestly, like, it depends on where you are in your career cycle and how good you are. So, I mean, at that point, it wasn't that much money. But, like, later in my career, when you, like, inertia is everything with these things. Like, if you're winning races for 10 years, then, like, the inertia of all these things, the value of this stuff becomes far far greater than it is when you're kicking ass and it's your first year kicking ass sure so there's a big discrepancy i mean my headgear sponsor that olympic year was maybe like twenty five thousand dollars, like not crazy versus like high seven figures for later in the career wow so that's a huge difference but you hadn't won any gold medals or done that much yet so no one's going to pay yeah. you that much at that point and with talking about money I'm not going to go too far into it right now because at this point, we've been going for a long time. I love talking about money and I feel like I want to ask you to do another podcast so we can talk more about money and the rest of your career because there's so much more to do that. Ted, will you do that for me? Yeah, I'd love to continue this conversation. Awesome. So I'm going to ask one last question about money and then I have a, a sneaky <laughs> final part of the podcast that we'll talk about. So my final question about money is, I've always thought that ski racers do way better than any type of skier out there in terms of finances. I mean, I know I was writing the checks. I wasn't personally, I was working for K2, being a team manager there for, you know, 15, 16 years. And I saw what the Seth Morrisons and the people like that were making in a year. And it was good money for Seth Morrison. But when I think about ski racers, was there ever a year in your career where you were able to make a million dollars? Yeah, there's a lot of years. <laughs> that's fucking amazing. Right? Yeah, I mean, that's like, I guess there's a lot of haves and haves not in ski racing. I mean, if you're first in the world, I um, mean, Mikhail is probably making at least five, I'd say, this year for her, her abilities. When she had years like that. But like the guy or, or girl who's fifth in the world is making a few hundred, maybe. And then it drops off quickly from there. If you're like 15th in the world, you're probably not even making six figures you're under, well under that so it drops off quickly and if you're 30th in the world you're paying to do your sport pretty much that's a total difference between the park pipe and big mountain skiers because the top of that sport is like the 15th to 20th person they're making like 100 grand a year it seems like you mean the number one and number two guy your travis rices of the world are making a lot of money but there aren't that many people making that much money in the other side of skiing so it's really awesome to hear that you're able to make a million dollars more than just one year because I was going to ask if it was 500000 and I was going to be like, you know what? Actually, I bet he's made more than that. So I threw out the million dollar number and boom, you are there. I love to hear it. It makes me happy. We are now at the segment of the show that I call Inappropriate Questions. And this part of the show is where I get someone that you know to ask three questions and they can be anything. I have a pre-recorded intro that I'm going to play for you because I can't pronounce this guy's last name and you are going to probably enjoy this. So we're going to jump into inappropriate questions right now. All right. 
I was able to get the Knight Rider. I'm talking about Felix Neurader. He's a three-time Olympian. He's a world champion. He's a good friend of yours, Ted. And I don't know when the last time you talked to Felix was, but Felix has three inappropriate questions for you. And Felix, can we jump into question number one? Hey, Ted, my friend. I hope you're doing good. I also hope that you're doing good after these questions. So, <laughs> my friend, question number one is, has anybody yet ironed your underwear beside my mom? <laughs> no, I think uh, Rosie is the only person that has ever ironed my underwear. <laughs> and why is your friend's mom ironing your underwear? Why is anybody ironing underwear, first of all? And then why is it your friend's mom? I mean, I've seen some of those German videos online, and they're pretty weird. Uh, <laughs> Felix is one of my closest friends in the World Cup, and being that like most of the races are in Europe, and if we had a little break, I would stay with him quite often. And so living out of my suitcase for six months, I needed to eventually do laundry here and there. And so his parents' house is a good place to do laundry. And his mom, Rosie Mittemeyer, um, she unfortunately recently passed, but... She was, you know, a legend in the sport, but she really insisted on doing my laundry. I tried hard to do my own laundry there, and she insisted, and she all went all the way to on the service to ironing my underwear. So very thankful for that. All right, so that is question one. We are going to jump into question number two. So the next question is, Ted, of course you remember World Cup Finals and Lancer Heide when you won the Cheers Globe because of me. yeah, um, You were kissing me in the finish area because of that. So my question is, when do I get my bonus of that money you made that day? All right, lots of things to unpack there. So you're, you're kissing Felix, he won the race for you, and you owe him money. Yes, he helped me win the title. Oh man, that's that's a hard one to unpack because I had to beat him legitimately. I don't think he like let up. But I had to beat him, and he had to beat Marcel Hersher for that to work out. So, oh, man, it wasn't like it was uh, as well organized of a coup on, on that sense. So, man, I do owe him. I, I have said a million times I owe him. So, yes, I'm going to have to figure that one out. I mean, it's unfortunately he's remembering that and bringing it up because I'll have to figure out something to square that deal off, I guess. <laughs> you know, I would almost say that some of those deals like that are some of those things that you handle at the moment. You don't come back four years later and be like, remember when I beat Marcel and now you owe me? Yeah, I mean, this is like nine years later. I mean, I definitely was buying him drinks that night, but obviously he was expecting more, which I guess I should have stepped up on. But he could have just come down and beat me and then I wouldn't owe him anything. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, we will go with your final inappropriate question. Kitzbühel 2013, one week before the World Championships in Schlabming. After the race, you were in the VIP tent with me, and it was Mia there, and also Andrew Weibrecht, I think. And you got super drunk. I carried you out of the tent, and I put you into the shuttle back to your hotel. So in Schlabming, you became three times world champion. So my question is... When do I get my bonus of taking care about you that day? Because otherwise, I think you would still sit in that tent. <laughs> so in retirement, Felix is saying that, Ted, you owe him pretty much a monthly check for the next few years just because he saved your ass a couple of different times. And he won a contest for you or he won a race for you. And then he saved you when you were passed out at the bar. Oh, man, I didn't, I didn't realize our relationship was so transactional. <laughs> I thought that's what, what, what friends do. but. I know there's definitely a few times that I've gotten Felix out of some situations as well. So that's what friends do. But I'm going to have to reassess where we stand in life, I guess. <laughs> All right, Ted. So that is the inappropriate questions. And that is our podcast. And normally I would have a little bit of an outro here talking about how an amazing career that you've had. But we haven't even really gotten into your career yet. You haven't won an Olympic gold medal yet. You haven't done anything like that in our podcast. That's all going to come next week. I thank you for making more time. I thank you for the time that you've given me today. And that's our podcast, man. Awesome. Thank you. So that was part one with Ted Ligeti. And I'll tell you, I knew Ted was the smaller kid growing up. And I knew that could have caused problems for a young Ted. But I had no idea that he was bullied when he was growing up. And while it seems like the bullying created a positive outcome for Ted... You could still tell that this time was a painful one for him in his life. 
So kids out there, if you're the little guy and you're being bullied in school or anywhere really, I know that it sucks and it's happened to a lot of people in this world, a lot of successful people like gold medalist Ted Ligety. So while bullying sucks and people who are bullies, well, they have issues that they need to deal with themselves, don't let it get you too down. Because while you might not realize it, the bully, well, he's most likely not going to go that far in life. And you, well, you're going to have some thicker skin because you had to endure some bullshit. And eventually, hopefully, you'll become a better person because of it, just like Ted did. But if it doesn't make you a better person and you can't find the good in it, reach out for help. Get a therapist. Do whatever you can to get yourself in a better mindset. Mental health is more important than ever these days. And while bad things are going to happen to all of us in life, it's what we do around those situations that will define us. I don't know where I'm going with this other than to say thank you to everyone for listening and please tell a friend about the podcast and please, please, please support the amazing brands that make this show happen. They are Stanley, Elon Skis, Rollerblade, Best Day Brewing, Peter Glenn Ski and Sports, and High Cascade Snowboard Camp. Have a great week, everyone.